everybody. Welcome to Practical Neuroscience, um, Episode 2. So, well, thanks again for coming to Vox Veritas, our online neuroscience lecture series. I am David Carrion, a psychiatrist at Stanford and researcher in neuroscience. Tonight's lecture is going to be a continuation from last week of Practical Neuroscience. And of course, if you weren't here, all our lectures are saved on YouTube. So check out my channel and you can go at your own pace. Um, so before we get started, I want to make some announcements. First of all, for our live audience, you can ask questions via YouTube, Twitter, email, um, or, well, actually, those are pretty much the only ways you could ask questions. Um, I suppose you could ask questions in your room, but then I won't be able to answer them. Um, I will try to answer as many questions as I can at the end of the lecture. Um, and uh, so here is uh, here's some of the uh, contact information. Uh, for those watching afterwards on YouTube, uh, you can also uh, ask questions on YouTube, comments, Twitter, or email. Uh, new this week is chat, so if you happen to have a Google or YouTube account, um, off to the side over there you should be able to see a chat box. Um, so just to, if you happen to be online, you can, uh, you can say hello in the chat. And, uh, and say hello to other people. We're going to be using that a few times during the lecture, so uh, sign in if you haven't already. All right. Um, so the uh, chat rules are simple. Please watch your language and treat others the way you'd like to be treated. Um, if you break the rules, you will receive one warning before you are banned. Forever. If you want to be unbanned, send me an email next week. Um, so... Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to begin by uh, a question that was asked last week. So uh, last week, one of you um, asked a question um, about how how did scientists figure out how many neurons and neuron connections people have in their brains? And um, as as sad as it is, and as difficult as this might sound, um, the answer is they counted. Um, and there's uh, this is this is a, a brain slicer. Uh, you can this is a, actually a small brain slicer size slight slicer. Uh, for uh, for rodents, and so you make little tiny cuts and you count, and it's a really painstaking process that takes a really really long time. But in the end, you're able to actually get the uh, get the answer you want. Um, so this is uh, this is the, the the and then you sort of count the number of uh, places that they're connected, um, and it's a it's a process that uh, that's not the kind of neuroscience that um, that I know how to do or that I like to do. But I'm glad that somebody did, so we have answers to these questions. All right. Um, so the uh, so this week we're going to review a little bit. Um, so the uh, the the we're going to review some of the things that we talked about um, last week. The uh, four things that we're going to talk about in this lecture. Number one, the brain is totally awesome. So we covered that mostly last week. Number two, the brain is extremely flexible. So we're going to finish off that section and move into section number three, your mind makes it real. And finally, number four, attention changes the brain. All right, you ready? Of course you're ready. Let's move on. So um, in the chat, if you happen to be in the chat, um, please answer the following question. Um, of these options, um, Here's a, here's a quiz. I'm sure you were expect you're excited to have a quiz on Sunday night, but um, tell me, do you think that A or B more closely captures your opinion? Um, a, you can always substantially change how intelligent you are, or um, and that no matter who you are, you can significantly change your level of talent. Or B, your intelligence is something about you that you can't change very much, or you you can learn new things, but you can't really change your basic level of talent. So um, in the chat, uh, please say either A or B. And we'll take a look at that um, at the end. All right. So um, the, uh, the the question um, was actually asked to a, a number of people. So the, the question of um, do you think you can, uh, do you think that intelligence is the kind of thing that can change? Um, do you think that, uh, or it's the kind of thing that's fixed? Um, this is a, a research of a researcher at uh, Stanford, um, someone named Carol Dweck. And uh, what she did is she, she started studying this particular feature and found that there's actually a, a whole number of uh, things that correlate with your belief that you can change your intelligence or you can change your level of talent. And um, so what she, what she did was uh, she, started, she started applying this to learning one of the most difficult things in the whole world, math. 
That's right. She decided to apply neuroscience to math. And so what she did was uh, she went to a, a situation that was actually really difficult. So uh, in inner city school. And um, what, uh, what the, the black line shows is when you're over here, um, as you sort of go through the years, you, uh, you start to drop down in your academic achievement. Um, as you go uh, in, in middle school, um, most people in these settings um, get worse and their grades continue to slide. But here, after time point two, she taught them what she calls the growth mindset. It's not that you're bad at math. It's not that you are naturally bad at math. It's that you're just unpracticed, that you, need to, you just need to practice more. Um, and so what happened was when she taught these kids that it's not that they're inherently bad at math, it turned their trajectory around. And look, they went up like this. She said, your brain is like a muscle. It's not that you are inherently bad. It's that you just need to, uh, you just need to do more practice and you'll get better. You build up that muscle. So um, that's actually the end of, uh, of, of section two. Um, section three is your mind makes it real. Now, for those of you who uh, were born after 1999, when one of the greatest sci-fi movies of all time came out, allow me to, um, to indulge you in a little bit of uh, memorabilia, a little bit of uh, going back in time. So the guy in the picture here is, is, is Morpheus, and uh, this is in the, in the movie, in The Matrix, you have this uh, situation where the main character finds out that reality is all just a giant illusion, that he's in a computer simulation. And so uh, he's training to, to be a superhero in this simulation, and at some point he runs and he jumps and he smacks his face, and he gets a bloody lip in the simulation, and he wakes up, and he touches his lip and there's blood there. And uh, he, asks, he asks Morpheus, hey, I thought it wasn't real, I thought it was just a computer simulation. And Morpheus says, your mind makes it real. What does he mean, and is that actually true? So, um, we're going to begin with an exercise. Um, all right, I know you're at your computers right now, but uh, indulge me. I want you to close your eyes and imagine that you're swinging a tennis racket. Just right now, close your eyes and just just a forehand swing of the tennis racket. Great. Okay. Now, I want you to imagine that you're looking at a bright, red, shiny apple. All right? Did you do that? Excellent. Okay. Now, what happened when you did that? Now, remember we talked about these different uh, parts of the brain last week. Um, what happened when you did that was uh, when, you, when I told you to swing the tennis racket, this part right here, the motor cortex, had to fire even though you didn't actually swing a tennis racket, just thinking about swinging the tennis racket makes it so that this part of the brain activates. So if I were to put you into an fMRI scanner and look at your brain, I would see, in fact, that you were, you were swinging a tennis racket in your mind. Now, um, what, about, what about the apple? Um, sure enough, if you think about an apple, you're, you're exciting your uh, occipital lobe, your visual cortex lights up, so when you were thinking about that apple, you actually were thinking about an apple. Though the mind's eye is actually um, is is uses the same part of the brain. So, what's the significance of this? Well, first of all, um, you can put electrodes into uh, into th into brains and see what happens. So this is actually a, a photograph from a video. Uh, you can Google the uh, to find the original video. But this is a monkey who has electrodes in its brain that is controlling a robotic arm. This is a cyborg monkey. Yes, this is real life. We are living, we are living in a world with cyborg monkeys. Do you realize how cool this is? Yes, in fact, cyborg monkey. So this cyborg monkey here is uh, being trained to uh, grab pieces of food over here and then drag it to its mouth and then um, and you know all doing all sorts of incredible incredible things um, using the neurons that have been uh, connected to the computer. Um, you know, we, we talk about the uh, man-machine interface is a man-monkey interface, a monkey, not a man-monkey. This is a monkey-machine interface. Um, so, all this to say, um, we are able to connect these things once we start to understand the firing patterns and the code that these uh, that they, they fire at. Um, what it, what else does this mean? What else does it mean? Well, knowing that uh, different parts of the brain are active is um, 
and, and when they're active, is really important for a number of things. So one of these is in uh, what are called persistent vegetative states. So somebody with a, uh, with a brain injury, for example, uh, might be put into this, this state where they're not very interactive. They're not dead, um, but uh, some people, uh, so, but, but they're not able to be interactive. They're still able to breathe. They're still able to, uh, to do basic, uh, basic functions, but they're, um, they're in this state. Um, and so it had long been thought that they weren't awake or conscious. Um, but, but one guy, a um, guy named Adrian Owen, started putting these patients um, into fMRI scanners. And so here we have a patient, and as you can see, normally the skull, this is a, 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 an image of a, a person, and, and this is, uh, the skull is supposed to be nice and round like this, but in fact it's, uh, it's, it's not nice and round, it's, it's kind of caved in. So this guy had really bad brain damage. You think like, man, how can you survive from that? Um, but he put this person, even this person, um, into a scanner and asked the person, swing a tennis racket. And what happened? This part of the brain lit up. The part of the brain controlling tennis rackets lit up in a patient who was in a persistent vegetative state. Then he was able to use that as a yes, and then another, uh, another function, uh, navigating around his house, imagining that, that shows up in a different part of the brain, um, for no. And he was able to actually ask questions um, of these people who, were, who had these terrible injuries, who had no ability to communicate with the outside world, people who couldn't talk, who couldn't even blink in response to questions, still had their brains that were active. Now, it was a, it was a small minority of people who had this. Uh, who had this. Most people were still uh, were not able to respond um, and, were, and did, had, give, did give no indication that they were awake or thinking. But the fact that, um, that we're able to start to, to look into people's brains and use that as a, as a response is incredible. So, what else? Now, if I asked you to, um, if, if you wanted to get stronger, um, what would you have to do? Well, of course, you would, you would go to the gym. Now, to go to the gym requires you to, um, to, to, to exercise, and your muscles get bigger, and then that's what makes you stronger, right? Well, that's actually only one of the two things that are making you stronger. So they did an experiment, um, scientists did an experiment, and um, actually before, before we explain the experiment, I need you to, uh, I need you to teach some anatomy. Um, I want to, uh, you, you hold up your hand, and I want you to move your finger, your pinky finger, out like that. So this, moment, this movement is called abductor. This is called the digiti minimi, the small finger. Abductor digiti minimi. It's this muscle right here. So it's a really neat muscle because it's uh, it's kind of on the surface. It's really small. You can put electrodes on top of it. Um, so it's a great it's a great uh, test mu muscle. So they built this apparatus and had people exercise their abductor digiti minimi, um, and they measured the force that was generated from that muscle. And then they asked people, um, "All right, that's great. So we want you to go home and exercise." Um, we want you to exercise your abductor digiti minimi, and we want you to do that for uh, 12 weeks for 15 minutes a day. Okay, 12 weeks, 15 minutes a day, of course, you get stronger. Um, and so as you see, you can, you actually get uh, quite a bit stronger, just about 50% stronger um, when, you, when you do this exercise, which makes sense, right? But then they had people say, okay, well, not, I don't, we don't want you to do physical exercise, we want you to think about moving your abductor digiti minimi for the same 15 minutes a day for 12 weeks. And what happened? They got stronger. They got stronger. So look at the, um, look at the, pink, uh, the pink bar here. You have a 30% increase in strength just by thinking about exercise. This is unbelievable. Now, the authors uh, of the paper uh, s attribute this to the fact that um, it's, it's, you're, you're increasing the uh, nerves and the neurons that are going to that muscle. So you're not actually having a larger muscle, but you are having more strength. Um, so there are these two effects that are happening. They also tried it with another muscle with the bicep, and the bicep didn't work quite so well. But the, the big idea here is that mental exercise counts as exercise, and even in a physical sense, even in a physical sense, you're getting stronger. Now, um, there's a number of different papers um, that, uh, that uh, have done various other tests of, of mental exercise, mental practice, um, and whether it be practicing a piano um, or practicing surgery, um, there's a number of papers that show that, in fact, um, practicing with practicing with thinking about it is almost as good sometimes even better than not pra than practicing with uh, than with with uh, virtual reality or with uh, not or with 
only practicing in, in, when you're present with the thing. So um, here the uh, the blue bars are people who practice with the uh, with uh, people practicing surgery, and they've got these little boxes where they they practice to learn how to do surgery. Um, and then there's the uh, the red the red bars mean uh, people who have uh, are practicing with virtual reality. The green bars are people practicing with uh, thinking about it. And on most measures, precision, accuracy, performance. The group that did the best wasn't the people who practiced with the virtual reality, but the people who just sat there and thought about it. That mental practice, in this case, is better than virtual reality practice. Just sitting there and thinking about this exercise is better than actual computer, computer simulation. This is incredible stuff. So um, we're going to go on to uh, another thing, another effect that is, um, is actually um, is, is mind-boggling in how uh, how big and important it is, and that is um, that's called the uh, the placebo effect. Now, the placebo effect was uh, discovered by a was discovered and described by a guy named Henry Beecher, who found that when he was a, he was a medic in uh, World War II, and found that when people came in with uh, severe gunshot wounds and he he ran out of uh, painkillers for them, he would just give them a, a, a injection of, of nothing, of, of, of water, and they got better, and, and, and their, their pain actually went away. And so what actually happens is that uh, your expectation for the relief um, actually makes it better. So this is, uh, this is called the placebo effect, and um, even in the case of uh, so taking a pill that has absolutely nothing in it makes it better. And this it doesn't even actually, it still actually works even if you know it's a placebo. Even if you know that there's nothing in the pill, it still has an effect. Less of an effect, but still has an effect. Um, and you can, it's not just for pain. Um, it could also be for things like uh, for things like uh, Parkinson's disease. So uh, Parkinson's disease is a, a movement disorder and uh, people have, uh, have sort of a, a shaking and a shuffling gait and there's a, it's a problem with dopamine. And you can actually go from having, um, this is a picture of, of a brain, go from having low dopamine to, uh, to normal levels of dopamine after giving somebody a placebo. So you're changing brain chemistry just by thinking about it. And it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, it starts in the brain, but it also goes out to the body. This is a picture of a, um, this is an ex another experiment they did. Um, and they actually classically conditioned people to uh, suppress their immune system. So they gave them strawberry milk and uh, strawberry milk and an immunosuppressant drug. Um, again, uh, the several times in a row. And then finally, at the um, on the fifth time, they gave them the strawberry milk, and then instead of a uh, instead of strawberry milk and the drug, they gave them strawberry milk and a placebo. And what happened? Sure enough, that after they got the uh, this is what happens uh, when they get the drug. The uh, it, these are two uh, markers of the immune system. Both drop when you give them the drug. When you just have the strawberry milk and the placebo, what happens? drops in those same chemicals. So you're actually affecting your immune system um, when you think in a particular kind of way. So this is, it's mind-boggling. And so we think, um, so you, when you think about pain, we think, uh, the, uh, we think that this is a, a very natural, biological, unchangeable thing. But in fact, um, as uh, one of my professors used to, uh, likes to say, the strain of pain lies mainly in the brain. And so, if you modify that effect uh, with the way you think about it, by suppressing the pain, or distracting yourself from the pain, or by hypnosis, or by imagery, by visualizing yourself in a different place, um, or by placebo, by, by being told that you have a chemical that, will, uh, that, that this pill is going to make you better, all of those things will reduce this very biological thing, this very, uh, this very fundamental response and actually get you a, um, an improvement in your, in your pain scores. Now, I'm sure this is what everybody wants to be uh, talking about, watching porn. Um, so a uh, material that is otherwise very biologically active, and um, in one case, um, this is what it normally activates, the amygdala, a part of the brain uh, which is uh, deep brain involved with, uh, with highly emotional situations, and when you suppress it, when you want to have the same visual stimulation, it doesn't activate. Um, so this, even this effect, that is as basic and as biological as you can imagine, is uh, is suppressible. Now, how do you respond to this? Well, there's a, a lot of evidence, a lot of research that's actually gone into studying um, this question. 
emotion, this is called emotion regulation. And a lot of the uh, research is done in showing people a face that is expressing an emotion and seeing how their, how their brains respond. And it's a, it's a very, um, a very interesting, um, an interesting uh, question. Uh, how do you respond to a, a challenging situation like this? Um, and so one way is to just do nothing and let, let it affect you. When you look at this picture, look at the eyes, experience it, and that emotion becomes contagious. This angry person now makes you anxious or angry yourself. Um, so it's a, uh, it's, a difficult, uh, it's a difficult thing to respond to. Um, another thing you could do is suppress that emotion. You could say, you know what, I don't want to experience anger right now, or I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna push it down. And I'm gonna push it down, and that's, that, um, that's another way, but it's not very effective. Um, the best way is something called reappraisal. Um, and reappraisal involves telling a story. It involves looking at the same response in a different way. So in this case, when you have a man who is uh, who has this face, you might look at that face and say, "Hmm, maybe uh, maybe he's not angry at me. Maybe he's just having a bad day." Um, or you might say, "Maybe he's constipated." You know, I don't know. He, he looks like he's not having a good time right now. Um, anything, any story you tell yourself can reduce the degree of emotion you experience. So it's not just something that, uh, that happens naturally, that happens without, uh, without, this, this, uh, without your involvement. Um, and so, we're, um, so it's, it's a, it's, this is a really important uh, uh, lesson to learn, that you're not just at the whim of your emotions. You are able to control them in, a, in an, important, an important way. And when you do that, um, there's actually a, a study they did in, in Britain, um, 60,000 people in Britain, and they asked questions like this. Um, do, do you feel like you were playing a useful part in things? Did you feel like you were constantly under strain? Are you being, are you been feeling uh, reasonably happy, all things considered? Have you been feeling unhappy and depressed, been losing self-confidence yourself? Even a single answer related to an increased risk of death by 20%. And six, yeah, six positive answers in this uh, survey nearly doubled your risk of death. So the uh, the question of of um, mental health is is a, is a big deal, and and having you know having these these positive moods and having these positive emotions um, is really important. But the trouble is, how do you if you if you are having these troubles, um, you can't just will yourself out of it. Um, it requires specific techniques. And one of the most effective techniques is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and this is uh, something that's been developed over the past few decades. Um, and there's, uh, the, the idea is trying to take control and, and learn how to turn those negative emotions into uh, something that's, that's manageable or, or reduce them. Um, this is a book, Feeling Good, that's been uh, studied under a number of um, scientific settings. And this is Mood Gym, um, a free online uh, course to go through uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and so we're going to practice this as our, as our final exercise. What happens when... Um, what happens when you get a bad grade? Has anybody ever gotten a bad grade before? I know I have. It sucks. It, it feels terrible. And what do you tell yourself? You tell yourself, "I'm stupid." I, that that was that reflects on my on my character. But what is a what is a way to reappraise that situation? The stimulus is the same. You still have the bad grade, but how do you reappraise that? Well, you could say, you know, maybe I maybe I didn't study hard enough. Maybe I should study harder next time. Or Maybe um, I could say that look, I, my my value as a person doesn't depend on my my grades. That I'm I'm a valuable person independent. Um, or you could say that uh, that that was an unfair test. Um, but in any case, when you tell yourself you're stupid, it creates this cycle of of feeling low, feeling depressed, feeling bad. Um, and when you respond in a positive way or, or with a with a, a true a good true story. You're able to actually uh, you're able to, to diffuse the uh, the pain. What about this one? You didn't get into Stanford, and you tell yourself, "I don't deserve to get in." Um, and this is uh, something that I think uh, you know, or I didn't get into the college that I wanted to. I didn't uh, make this accomplishment that I wanted to make. And the way you respond to this uh, really can make you feel bad about everything you didn't get. I know people who were vice presidents who were depressed because they weren't the president. They didn't achieve everything that they wanted. Um, and so it's difficult. We, we can set these standards for ourselves and feel bad in any situation. Um, but really trying to realize that, look, my, my, my value as a human being, just like my grades, doesn't depend on my acceptance to certain universities. Now, what about 
What about if uh, if you get dumped? Your uh, BF or GF dumps you. Um, that feels terrible. And what if you say uh, you might tell yourself, "Look, I'm I'm actually unlovable. I'm I'm ugly. I don't I don't uh, I'm not I'm not worthy of, of him or her." Um, but but again, what, what what can you tell yourself? You can you can take that situation and ask yourself, "Why do I feel this way? I'm I'm not actually unlovable. Um, it's just that this particular person doesn't doesn't love me, um, or doesn't want to be with me, or has other things going on, or uh, there's a hundred other things that could be going on other than I am inherently unlovable or I am inherently ugly." There's uh, so going through this process will allow you to diffuse a lot of these negative emotions. All right, it is. Time for questions. So, um, if you would please in the chat um, send the uh, send me those questions um, that you have, um, and so I will uh, do my best to try to answer those questions. And uh, let me know um, what you'd like to what you'd like to know. So, okay. So, for the first question, I'm going to ask about. Uh, the question is uh, about how do we how do we uh, practice this uh, this this situation? How do we practice uh, these uh, adjusting our mood? Well, it's it's something that. Um, it, it's something that when you, you continue to practice in your mind um, all the time, it's it's something that uh, that take that that does take practice. Um, just like we talked about at the beginning about um, the Carol Dweck things, um, it's something that you can continue um, to uh, to to think about when you have difficult situations. Um, so it's something that uh, that does take a lot of practice, and you can um, you can master with time. All right. Um, oh, uh, question number uh, question number two. What is fMRI? Um, it stands for functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, basically, all those uh, most of those pictures you see with uh, the brain lighting up in different areas, it shows blood flow in the brain. Um, there's a lot more I could say about it um, at another time. MRI physics is intriguing, uh, but for the short version of it, is it, it tells you what parts of the brain are active when you do a particular task, and. Um, Question number two. Um, so if I just think about exercising, I can get uh, really buff. Well, um, doesn't seem like the uh, you can increase your strength. It seems, and probably in small muscles more than large muscles. Um, but it doesn't seem like you'll be able to actually get ripped. You won't be able to have uh, giant muscles. At least, uh, at least that's what it seems like. Uh, to do that, you actually need to uh, physically exercise. Unfortunately. Um, and number three. Uh, no, actually, I think we're up to number four. Um, how do they know? Um, how much being negative increases the risk of death. Well, they, uh, the way they do these studies oftentimes is they will um, ask a question, they'll get a whole group of people, so in this case 60,000 people, ask them these questions and then wait five years and see how many of them are still alive. And then they can find out based on the, two, the different groups what is the risk of answering um, yes to this, uh, this questionnaire. Um, so it's a it's a statistical effect and it might be, uh, it might be that, 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 and correlation is not causation, um, as you will probably hear me say more than once in this program, um, so there's other possible explanations, um, but the um, but the suggestion is that uh, that good mental health certainly correlates and maybe causes um, this, uh, this 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 survival. Um, so the um, that is it for today. Um, thanks for watching. If you're interested in these topics, please let us know. We love feedback, um, and you're welcome to uh, email or tweet or uh, comment um, on any of these things. And uh, so please do, um, please do tune in next week, uh, Sundays at 8.28 p.m. Next week's topic is Practical Neuroscience Part 3. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful Sunday night.